Hey friends, I noticed that Front of Mythic just came out with a new video titled Humanoid Aliens, How Plausible Are They? It's good, and I'll include a link down below. It focuses on the probability argument that it's impossibly unlikely that alien life would just happen to stumble across nearly identical gene genetics to produce aliens that look just like us. I gave a similar talk seven or eight years ago, but I focused on a somewhat different aspect of the problem, the issue of historical contingency. It was also a lecture, you know, one of those things where you have to physically go into a room where a few hundred people have to be physically present at that one specific instant when it occurs. It wasn't on YouTube. So I thought, hey, I can just repeat that same talk with some updates and record it. So that's what I'm doing here, with mostly the same slides I used first time around. About those slides, I included a sidebar on the left that contains slices of photographs of earthly diversity, the point being that if we get this much variation on our one small planet, why are you expecting an absence of diversity elsewhere? So you might notice a slightly distracting thing off to the left on every slide that illustrates some weird animal from planet Earth. Okay, so one question is, is there extraterrestrial life to consider? And I think the answer has to be yes. As of today, in 2018, there are 3,767 confirmed planets in 2,816 systems. Uh, when I last gave this talk years ago, I think the number was more like about 600 planets. So this is increasing at a phenomenal rate. And tomorrow, there will probably be even more known. The ast astronomers just keep piling up the data, so it's inarguable that the stars routinely spawn planets. The consensus in biology is that life's simply a specialized class of chemistry, and that life of some sort will arise as a product of, the th of thermodynamic trends whenever you have a certain range of chemical energies available with a rich source of organic molecules. So we kind of expect at this point that any planet just warm enough to have liquid water will have some kind of life arise on it. It might never rise above a unicellular sludge, but it's still a living, reacting, consuming energy and re replicating. And who knows, there may be other exotic, to us at least, chemical regimes that produce some kind of life. It worked here on Earth, and it produced a wildly diverse collection of life forms. This circular diagram illustrates the tree of animal life. We're excluding plants and fungi, for instance, to show the pedigree of just metazoans from their origin between a billion and two billion years ago, which is located at the center of the diagram, to contemporary forms on the outside of the ring. So, one question might be, does this describe completely the morpho morphological potential of life? Is this an optimum constrained by functionality? That is, we could imagine weirder forms than these that exist now, but they aren't viable. Selection effectively winnows down the range of the possible down to the realm of the probable, and here it is. We know that this is not true. Because, for instance, these are all extant species, and it, this diagram doesn't include trilobites and tyrannosaurs, so we know this is grossly incomplete. But can life include forms that are even weirder? There are two schools of thought. One says, yes, selection is very efficient, and the diversity of life on the planet represents evolutionary optima, and that any planet with similar conditions should evolve similar forms. They'd be different in detail, but sure, intelligent aliens could be bipedal humanoids. Maybe they'd be little and green, but they'd look roughly like us. The other school of thought emphasizes chance and contingency, that we aren't shaped by just selective processes, but also by the random availability of mutations in our evolutionary history. I'm a biped because I'm derived from mammals which are tetrapods, or four-limbed creatures. If I were derived from hexapods, I'd look very different. Yet when we look at popular science fiction, 
it's rare to see the freakishly, freakishly weird range of diverse life forms that have to exist. This idea that they'd necessarily be humanoids like us is nonsense. And it persists because the function of drama is to illustrate human concerns, and too much bizarreness interferes with a deeper portrayal of human relationships. But let's not ignore the fact that this is a portrait of convenience, not biology. It's pervasive in our culture with media that constantly portrays fictional aliens as looking almost exactly like us, either taller and bluer, or sometimes even with latex appliances glued to their heads. Although this last picture suggests that there may be deeper differences in the anatomy of the perineum, since he's apparently flashing her the Vulcan version of the shocker. There are also science-based arguments for a possible plethora of humanoid species by renowned paleontologists like Simon Conway Morris, who wrote a whole book titled Life Solution, in which he argued that the ultimate goal of evolution was intelligent humanoids who could understand God's word. His final chapter was a fantasy in purple prose in which a trio of aliens land on his lawn and walk up on two legs and look at him with two eyes and ask to come in for tea. So not only is evolution driving towards humans in life's solution, but they're going to be British. Simon Conway Morris is a smart guy, so it's not as if he just plucked the whole scenario out of his butt, although I do think he's biased by his deep Christian religiosity, which leads him to conclude that intelligent life everywhere must be made in the form of God, who we all know is a bipedal mammal with apparently a fondness for tea. But he's not alone. Here's another example. Uh, This is a display that was in the National Museum of Canada in Ottawa. That creature on the right is a reconstruction of a fossil troodon, that is, a real theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous. It was relatively large-brained, leading the creator to speculate, well, what if that meteor hadn't wiped out all the dinosaurs, giving Troodon the opportunity to evolve tool-using intelligence? Setting aside the obvious fact that Troodon was a successful beast, as it was, and there was not necessarily any evolutionary incentive to become more intelligent, the creator made that very silly mannequin on the left, suggesting that one perfectly surplus serviceable saurian biped would abandon its functional form to look more like a scaly ape or a David Icke wet dream. This is absurd for reasons I'll explain, but what it means is that there is a bias in some biologists to consider the humanoid form to be an optimal ideal, and that thanks to the power of natural selection, there is pressure to optimize diverse organisms to converge on our particular morphology. Maybe that's not too far out as a general idea, and convergence is at the heart of Simon Conway's Morse's argument that life's solution is people. But convergence is real. Uh, It's a particularly good observed phenomenon that forms a rationale for that argument by Conway Morse. If you take organisms with initially similar body plans and you put them in an environment where there is selection for a particular function or a particular niche to fill, you'll sometimes see superficially similar solutions emerge. On the left is a Tasmanian tiger or thylacine, an extinct marsupial that filled the role of a large predator. On the right is another large predator, the gray wolf you should be able to see that independently on different continents, local mammals evolved to be fast, active hunters with fang jaws, and they do look somewhat similar. Of course, when you look in detail at the anatomy, the differences leap out at you, and no wolf or thylacine would confuse one for the other. I would concede that if a primitive primate were to somehow colonize an alien world, And if that lineage gave rise to an intelligent tool user, it would probably continue to look humanoid, at least as much as that thylacine looks like a wolfoid. But here's the catch. That's only true if you start with a tetrapod mammal, particularly a primate. And with a different genetic stock, there are many different solutions to the same fundamental problem. Consider just the bipedalism part. These are all bipeds. 
We're not going to confuse them for each other, not even in a dim room. Another factor behind the convergence here is that all of these are ancestrally related. They're all tetrapods or derived from four-limbed ancestors. We're bipeds because we're limited to only four limbs, and if one pair gets specialized for a specific function, you're only left with two for locomotion. So this is a product of an ancestral limitation. Look at other lineages with no such limiting heritage, and bipeds are really, really rare. Among the invertebrates, the closest thing I can find to that vertical posture is something like a praying mantis. But of course, it's got four legs dedicated to movement. Bipedalism really is nothing more than an oddball vertebrate artifact. We can go further, too. All these creatures have heads with faces with two eyes and a jaw and a nose. That's not a necessary arrangement. Let's look at some arthropod faces. See, if these guys land in your front lawn and ask for a cup of tea, you aren't going to confuse him with Mark Hamill, for instance. And it's not just superficial differences in appearance, it's about deep functional differences. Let me give you one example of a very different solution to a common problem, and that is how to eat in an aquatic environment. The thing is, if you rush forward through a dense medium like water, you're also pushing, pushing a mass of water in front of you that will actually push your prey away from you. So let's think about how to catch that tasty food item in front of you. Bony fish have a brilliant solution. They have toothy jaws, and what they have is a regular cranial ballet of adaptations that allow them to capture prey. When they lunge forward, the jaw gapes and the gill covers flare, greatly expanding the volume of the oral cavity. So as they advance, they also suck in a huge volume of water, swallowing the mass of water in front of them and hopefully also the prey within it. It's very cool. Uh, some fish even go further with extreme adaptations like this moray eel that also has a second set of jaws slung deep in its throat. So it lunges, opens wide like a typical fish, and then also spears the prey with the little jaws which clamp down and hold it in place while the big jaws tear it to shreds. Awesome, right? You may have seen something similar in a science fiction movie. But are jaws and suction the only way to solve the hydrodynamic problem? No, of course not. Let's look at squid. These are frames from a high-speed cinematographic record of a squid catching a shrimp, with each frame separated by 10 milliseconds. So this whole movie only covers about an eighth of a second. The squid starts with all ten arms pressed tightly to one another, forming a streamlined cone. Then the central two tentacles spear outwards to grasp the shrimp, while the other eight flare outwards and fling backwards to counterbalance it. And then dinner. It's beautiful. It's the same physical problem for both fish and squid. Fast prey capture in a dense medium, but radically different biological solutions. Why do they differ so much? And one reason is history. Different phyla of organisms have different ancestral roots, which constrain available solutions. On the top is an inferred Precambrian chordate. It has a dorsal nerve cord and a central springy skeleton called the notochord, and a postanal tail for swimming. This is an animal specialized for swimming, and it has no limbs. Limbs evolve later and a kind of a last-minute change bolted on. Vertebrates have always suffered from a dearth of limbs, hence bipedalism. At the bottom is an arthropod. Key elements of their body plan are an inversion of the central organs, a ventral nerve cord instead of a dorsal one, and a set of limbs in every segment. Arthropods have had limbs to spare. The top picture is our heritage. It affects everything evolution can do to modify its descendants. And it's easy to see how some forms are dependent on that. This is one of the pinnacles of vertebrate evolution, a bony fish. There are over 30,000 species of fish, 
So hands down, this is the most successful vertebrate solution ever. Note the streamlined form, the tor torpedo shape. Its internal skeleton is a flexible spring. That notochord I mentioned modified, flanked by big slabs of muscle that propel it through the water. At the front end is a sensory array, a eyes and pressure and olfactory sensors, and elaborate jaws and prey capture reflexes that I've already mentioned. This is the perfect product of adaptive function. Surely every planet we visit someday will have to have fishoids, these torpedo-shaped predators, right? Hang on, wait. Here's the perfect product of adaptive evolution. Physics dictates that torpedo shape, and there are many arrangements of body parts that can produce that. Here, the sensory array is mid-body. The front is dominated by manipulatory appendages. There is no internal skeleton. Movement is achieved by flying through the water with these fins or by contractions of this muscular tube to generate jet propulsion. So, fishoids aren't necessarily interplanetary universals. But let's not go the other way and suggest that squidoids are either. Uh, the answer is that nature is always going to surprise us with novel solutions and working backwards to make a Panglossian rationalization that every solution represents the best of all possible solutions is a fallacy. So why do squid look so different from fish? It's the body plan. This is the squid body plan, revealed in embryos of the three extant divisions of the group. They are all a visceral bag with muscular appendages dangling down. That's the rootstock evolution has to work with, and it's very different from the vertebrate rootstock, which is a springy rod surrounded by muscle. It's the Pinewood Derby problem. All of you far, former Cub Scouts remember this. You're handed this rectangular block of wood, four plastic wheels, and some miscellaneous fasteners, and you're told to shape this into a model vehicle to race down a runway. Everyone comes up with similar solutions, but the details can be creative and inventive. But what if instead the Cub Scouts were handed a big lump of putty, some ball bearings, and a dozen balloons, and told to make a racer? What if it were a bucket of plastic straws, some plaster of Paris, and rubber bands? Different starting conditions, very different solutions will emerge. Okay, I have to say a few words about intelligence, and that is, intelligence doesn't seem to be a very likely solution to evolutionary problems. It's like a wacky pinewood derby car made by balancing the block of wood on end and turning it into a unicycle. Maybe there's a design that would work, but it seems to be rather improbable. And nature has had opportunities to try. This is a diagram of the history of Earth from a biological perspective. What it illustrates is that life thrives for long periods of tens to hundreds of millions of years, and then five times in the past half billion years, there have been abrupt mass extinctions, geologically short intervals in which 90 to 99% of all the animal species of the planet have been totally wiped out, followed by regrowth and expansion. The, the best known is the Cretaceous extinction, which was about 70 million years ago, which exterminated the dinosaurs. The biggest was the Permian extinction, 250 million years ago, that simply devastated the planet. Each of these was like a big game over moment, a reset that wiped the slate mostly clean, and then we resume play. So we can think of this as six related but alien worlds, six trials to see if evolution would spit up an intelligent tool using species. Now to be fair, let's exclude the first two. Animal life was primarily aquatic, so maybe it's fair to say they don't have a chance to invent fire, but these Later, four all had large, complex extraterrestrial animals in complex environments. And only now, in the Quaternary, has it happened. Even there, once tool-using intelligence emerges, it can expand rather quickly. We hominids evolved like lightning over a few million years, yet Troodon didn't do it. 
No other terrestrial animals have done it quite like we have at any time in the last 400 million years. Intelligence is not a ubiquitous adaptation. It's not like fangs or claws or wings or eyes, features that pop up independently in multiple lineages. It's a great rarity. And we can't even judge whether, on a geological scale, it's even a long-term evolutionary success. We've had agriculture for only a few thousand years, industrial technologies for only a few hundred, and we can already see major obstacles to our survival looming on the horizon. Maybe we should also recognize that intelligence doesn't seem to be one kind of thing either. Here are representatives of four groups of animals that show great potential for intelligence. They are self-aware, puzzle-solving, curious, and exploring creatures. The primates, some birds like Stellar's jays, cetaceans, and octopods. Science fiction stories love to speculate about meeting and communicating with aliens, but they always cheat and make the aliens mirrors of ourselves. So it's relatively easy. Here are four species that are far more closely related to us, that share far more in common with, with us than any aliens we might ever encounter. Yet we're trying harder to listen to the conversations of unknown aliens with SETI than we are trying to have a chat with our next-door neighbor, Octopus vulgaris. I suggest to you that extraterrestrial aliens are not impossible, but they may be rarer than you think. And furthermore, that they're going to be weirder than you can imagine. And if you can't think what to say to an earthbound intelligent mollusk, you're going to have a really tough time with the biochemically bizarre, anatomically improbable, historically unrelated tentacled blobs of Fomalhaut or whatever. So, to summarize, these are some general principles of biology that will universally apply. Evolution, evolution doesn't just make finely tuned functional organisms, but it's also built on a foundation of chance. So it spawns endless diversity. Every advance carries along the baggage of its ancestry, so we see echoes of our past in every feature. And the more specific and complex a feature is, and intelligence is both of those, the less likely it is to emerge in the same form in different lineages. There's one more brief and somewhat tangential point I have to make, because it's weird and it keeps coming up. I call it the Kirk Effect. To boldly go and explore strange new worlds, and to hump all the women on them. This is not going to happen. Here's a recent outrageous example of this from the space fantasy movie Avatar. James Cameron consciously chose for understandable, dramatic, and profit-making reasons to completely ignore what science said and shape his aliens to fit human expectations. And that meant making them sexy. This is more than just sticking large lumps of adipose tissue on the female's chest. It's deep and subtle changes to the shape of the face, the eyes, the whole of the body, cues that we all unconsciously recognize. You don't even need to see a person face-on to recognize sex. All you heterosexual men and lesbians, you know this. The sight of the nape of the neck, the curve of the waist to hip, all those are enough to make your heart go pit-a-pat. And all you heterosexual women and gay men, broad shoulders, narrow hips, muscular buns, they can do it for you, right? So... Let me show you. I know this may be a family audience, so if you're shy about female nudity or assertive sexual displays, I'm, I'm warning you. I'm going to show you a bit of porn to make my point. So put your hands over your kid's eyes or your own, because this may be an arousing image. That is, if you're a chimpanzee. That's an image rich in sexual cues for a chimp. Uh, the posture, the sleek, hairy body, the genitalia greatly swollen by estrus into a bright pink lump. If there were a chimpanzee Hugh Hefner, he'd be printing stacks of magazines full of glossy photos just like this one. Now, I know there's always one in a large crowd, Rule 34 and all that, but I can pretty much guarantee that almost all of you find that completely lacking in all of the sexual cues that might stimulate you. 
and the majority probably find it entirely repellent. It's so far from our species-specific form of sexual attraction. And this is our closest living relative. So, one last word of advice. If you've been swayed by all the romantic imagery of the science fiction media that suggest alien planets are full of intelligent alien babes of exotic beauty, forget it. Space travel won't get you laid. Although you never know, humans can be weird. Uh, you get that. Uh. <laughs> hey, get a room, guys. Um. Whoa! Oof. Hey, Fred. Oh. Hey, Fred. Oh. Um. Oh, that's not right. No.